here. This is James L. Allen, Country Cooking and Variety Show. I'm here with a gentleman that I consider a friend. Uh, he was he did a radio show with me when you were running for sheriff some yeah. years ago, and he ran unopposed this year, and that's saying a lot right there. It, it's in several things I think. It's first, I don't think nobody thought they were qualified to fill your shoes. Okay. Or they weren't crazy and, uh, enough, maybe. <laughs> oh, listen, to you. but hey, you're doing a good job. Thank you're you. You're doing a very good job. Okay. And like you said, there can always be naysayers. This is what I said to the mayor of Stockton. There can always be somebody that's going to give you down the road, okay? But, hey, you can look above that, and you keep moving forward. Right. You've got a large department to operate with. I didn't realize how – I know I see sheriff cars everywhere, okay? But you're the seventh largest in the United States. That's saying a lot. You've got a lot of responsibility, and people that yeah. aren't used to having responsibility don't really understand. It's right? very large. There's a couple of unique things about our sheriff's department. One, that we're very large. The average size sheriff's department is 28 and a half officers. We have mm. over 1,300. Mm. Um, and the other unique thing about Sacramento County is the largest population center in Sac County is in the unincorporated area. So mm. the largest population center is not in the cities, like in most counties, mm. but it's actually in the unincorporated county area that we provide primary law enforcement for. So. Well, I, well since we're I see you guys there looking over the shoulders of a lot of local law enforcement people. You well, know? I'm not sure if that's, I mean, we, we work definitely hand in hand. We work shoulder to shoulder, I yeah. guess would be a better way to say it. But yeah, we, we have um, seven cities. Uh, in Sacramento, one, we provide contract uh, law enforcement for Ranch Cordova. We provide yeah. well, law enforcement under contract. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we we all work very, very well together. There's not one thing that any one of us are involved in that the others aren't invited to be a partner in. Well, I know you, you guys had a tragedy in your department. I did. And I feel for you. I sent you a condolence on, Thank on you. Facebook to you. And, like, the way you guys shut everything down that day, I admire you. I mean, you guys were on top of things. And I know you're in an organization where you all feel like when something happens to one, it happens to all of you, okay? Yeah. Um, a few questions. I don't have a lot of questions I want to ask, and I'm going to let you have, have the platform here. But uh, how, what is your stance on immigration? You know, immigration is, it actually has become kind of an interesting sort of a passion of mine. I mean, I have concerns, I have thoughts about immigration, like many Americans. And then um, I think it was the death of, of Danny Oliver, the, the murder of our officer, um, along with Detective Mike Davis up in Placer that day by the subject who was four times removed from this country without consequences for any of it. And um, so that really, you know, not saying that that could have been avoided with better laws, but that really was the catalyst for, for me to say, I need to do something. I have a political voice. I have 1.4 million uh, people as my constituency. I have a larger political voice than any mayor or U.S. congressman or anybody. Mm -hmm. So I think it, I, I feel a responsibility to use it. And so I, I've spoken on immigration. I've, I've made a YouTube video plea to the president talking about the things that I'd like to see him do on the national front. Mm -hmm. I've actually been back to Washington um, this past week. Last Tuesday, I flew to Washington, flew back yeah. Wednesday yeah. Um, to speak. And I was invited to speak at a, um, at a House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, mm -hmm. um, Congressional Committee, about immigration itself. So I'm, I'm active. Uh, I think my, I'm getting a, a larger voice in it. But to answer your question more directly, the, the stance on it is, you know, I, I am, I am pro-immigrant. Many of us came here um, one or two generations removed from being immigrants. Um, I, I don't know how birth order is established, but mm. if I were born in Mexico, I would probably very much be attracted to what America has to offer. I might be in their shoes. So well, you know, a lot of people haven't been in a third world country. That's right. It's not like we live it, here. It's not, not in just country. like America, but different. Here Absolutely not. Else in the world. And I get that. Although I don't think that amnesty or deferred action does any justice for the immigrant population. I think it qualitatively decides that one group of immigrants is somehow more valuable than the other group and, and kind of pushes that group further back into the shadows. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see government reform that, that takes care of all 11 or 12 million undocumented immigrants that are in America, whether it's a pathway to citizenship, whether it's a guest worker, whether it's a, any of the visa programs that are available. Mm -hmm. But this piecemealing out and the president attacking Congress, the Congress attacking the president, that's getting nothing done. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'd like to see secure borders in the sense that people that come into the country illegally have consequences mm -hmm. um, rather than just do it at will. And it's not just about Mexican nationals. It's mm -hmm. about terrorism. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a country now that people can come into this country at will without any fear of repercussion. And, you know, if I know that and you know that, the terrorists know that. And there are people sworn to do harm to this country. And we ought to be paying attention well, to that. I want to address that particular issue that you brought up then, because you know I'm a farmer back in Oklahoma, yeah. Texas. And... Uh, 
at one time there was a, a situation where if a farmer stood for a group of immigrants, they could get their green cards. Yeah. Well, 99% of these immigrants were Hispanic, but the other 1% were coming from Eastern. Block, That's right. Okay. I mean, I, I, my neighbor was saying, he said, no, nah, he said, uh, all these guys, they look like they're Hispanic, but they're not. You right. see guys coming from Jordan. I got guys coming from all over the Middle East, you know. You just don't know. And many of those and folks they're, they're can be here. looking for a better life. They could yeah. be kind of political refugees, if you were. Be. Or they could not be. I mean, if I was a terrorist leader, I know uh, that I want to get people into America. So I'm going to be looking for ways to do that. So um, it's not just about Mexican nationals. No. Um, it's about let's... Let's recognize the value, the contributions that that population, in, in, in particular, the Mexican nationals, play in our economies, in our agriculture, especially in California. We have an estimated 24% of the nation's undocumented population here in California. Let's recognize the value and the hardworking men, women, and families that want nothing more than to live the American dream. I want that. You want that for them. Everybody wants that for them. Let's figure out a way to make it happen while maintaining the integrity of our safety for our country in the process. Now, in Texas, like I say, I farm in Texas. I grow organic vegetables. And I had a gentleman that I gave a job to, and I was talking to him, and I didn't realize it until I took him to the bank to pay him that weekend, he didn't have any identification. And I'm like, okay. Things started, to, I'm like, how long have you been here? He said, I've been here for 24 years. I said, okay, I'm going to help you get your green card, okay? I contacted Homeland Security. You know, I said, first of all, I'm trying to protect me, too. Sure. Okay, and second of all, you've been here. You're hiding in the shadows, and I could see the guy was 63 years old. And like I told him, I wish I could work. I'm only a couple of years old. I wish I could work as hard as you do. Yeah, right, okay? right. They appreciate exactly that you right. always, I mean, with our, our race, any other race, you're always going to have somebody that's going to do something underhandedly. Okay, like you said, this guy's been in there four times. Right. Okay, that doesn't make sense. We've got National Guard people sitting around. They get paid every month. We got reservists. We can tighten the borders up. We can check we could. these people out a lot better than what we're doing. We okay. could, and we could certainly. It doesn't necessarily involve a fence, but it you know involves changing the mindset of the policymakers in Washington that there are going to be consequences. The, the, the gentleman, not really a gentleman, but the person responsible for the murders of these two officers was deported. And mm. the next year he was caught in this country illegally after deportation, which mm. is a felony. And he was simply brought back across the border that day. Three days later, caught again, released across the border the same day, and then caught in and physically mm. deported the fourth time. And then somewhere came in. I don't think it's funny in. while I'm laughing, but it, it's a coincidence. When I was in college, I worked as a machinist, okay? And Immigration would come through every Thursday, and they would pick all these guys up. Monday morning, they were back to work. Yeah. It was just a revolving door. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's not, you know, the unfortunate part where I am is, is I make an easy target. If you're, if you're willing to stand up, you know, for what you believe in, you make a target. And so these advocacy groups that purport to speak for, for some of these groups uh, have said that, you know, I, I, I'm racist or I'm anti-immigrant. And, Nothing could be further from the truth. I, I want to, to create a, a country where the whole country is safe, including the undocumented population, because from a law enforcement perspective, first of all, I have no interest in enforcing immigration law. I don't care about enforcing someone's immigration or, or, or their, um, their citizenship status. I don't care. What I care about is creating a safe community for everyone, including that population. And the problem is, is I want folks that are undocumented especially, and we have a large population here in Sacramento, that is undocumented. I want them to be comfortable enough, to, to feel secure enough, to call us if they need help. And guess who oftentimes is victimizing this undocumented population? Mm -hmm. Other undocumented folks, mm -hmm. because they feel confident. They won't call us, because somehow we may find out about their, their citizenship status and take in, uh, immigration enforcement action, which we will not do. So I have to spend a lot of time with this population saying, look, we, we, I don't care. I'm not going to, we're not going to have an immigration checkpoints. I want you to call me. If you need help, I'm not even going to ask your immigration. We're going to send an officer. We're going to help you just like we would anybody else. And then we're going to leave. I felt so bad. Like I said, I was working at this machine shop. Here's a guy working next to me. I mean, he worked just as hard as anybody else did, you know, and he, he was, uh, his own people ran the company. He was getting, making half the pay that I was, yeah. okay? And but well, yeah, that, that's he the, could that's live a lot better thing. at even half the pay sure. than he could in his country. And he gets to send fair. money back. When you do injustice against your own, okay, that's what I have an issue with. Okay. Yeah.
And there's a lot of that going on. And that's because they aren't allowed to have any status. I mean, you know, you mentioned the ID. The ID is a problem. I mean, you look at even states that issue um, driver's licenses, like mm -hmm. California now does. Uh, if they're honest with you, most of those states will tell you that they're predicated upon false forged birth certificates or inadequate ID, like a, like a maybe a utility bill. But, you know, when you sign up for utilities, you give them the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In California, you don't have to... Um, the way the law is set up, you don't have to supply any government documentation whatsoever. You can set an appointment with a DMV worker and go in and talk to them, and they can, quote-unquote, verify your identification. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me through a, a conversation <laughs> how somebody's going to verify <laughs> your ID. Exactly you so are. the point is, and I don't even care. I don't even care if you're known as Person B, as long as you're known as Person B in California, Nevada, anywhere in America. I don't care what you were if you're a person A in Mexico, don't care. But I want to make sure you're person B the whole time you're in America. We don't have that now. And so it not only puts the public at risk for those folks and that portion of the population that's going to choose crime as a way of life, but it puts officers at grave risk because what can happen is an officer believes that they're in what they would consider a casual encounter, yet they don't appreciate the desperation that the person might feel because he knows what his criminal history is. Mm -hmm. He knows he is on a wire because he's doing, he has several different identifications mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully they won't find out the one that's responsible for criminal or has warrants. He knows what level of desperation that he might be facing deportation. Mm -hmm. That officer doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. And that has led, in, in the case of Danny Oliver, did lead into officers getting attacked mm -hmm. and or killed. So it's not just the safety of the population we're talking about. Uh, America-wide, but even in our community, but the safety of our officers as well. I was talking to my wife, and I was telling her, I am glad that a lot of illegal people in the country, in California especially, are getting a driver's license. You have to learn the rules of the road, okay? You can get insurance, okay? So we all aren't putting jeopardy out here by someone that doesn't know the rules of the road, okay? That's going to run over and hurt somebody, kill somebody, whatever, and we're just out there to deal with our loved ones, our friends, whoever it is that this happened to. Yeah. At least I could say they have to know what we're going on. Because, I mean, a lot of people here don't know how to drive. Okay? Well, I, I agree with that. <laughs> but uh, you got someone coming from another country, the rules are different. I've gone to they are different. different countries where I've seen someone have an automobile accident. And they get out and just go at it. I mean, they yeah. just blow for a blow, you know. But that's the way it, it's that country. Our country is not set up that way. Right. Okay. And like I say, learn the rules of the road, get insurance. So you can protect me and yourself. Okay? Yeah, so from a perspective of, of learning what to drive or how to drive and the rules of the road, the signage and, and all those things, and, and the ability to get insurance, like you mm -hmm. mentioned, great. But unfortunately, like many things, they never talked with law enforcement in, in, in developing this. So, so from the ID perspective, it's terrible. And, and most DMVs, including California, mm -hmm. do not share any information with ICE. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you could have someone getting a driver's license here that is a wanted murderer in another right. state. Yeah. And there would never be any cross-referencing mm -hmm. to be able to check. That's not true of a citizen because you give a thumbprint and you're known as one person. No matter where you go, mm -hmm. you're connected by this federal database of mm -hmm. fingerprints. Well, that's, that's just not true. So, you know, I, I get criticized a lot uh, for it. But, you know, it's like I tell people, look, I, I'm very interested in giving folks the same rights. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in giving them greater rights than the citizen. In other words, there's no reason they need any more protection anyone than there. anyone that's already in the yeah. country. I want to create a level playing field, but you know, the advocacy groups and so forth want it to be something more. And so, you know, we often don't see eye to eye on that. I think we agree mostly, but we don't see often eye to eye. But, um, you know, uh, unfortunately for me, as I have, I have dual purposes, I, you know, the advocates have one purpose. I have to, a, a community of 1.4 million people to keep safe. Mm -hmm. And so that sometimes has to have, in my mind, me balancing mm -hmm. the rights of folks against the rights of the others that are being affected by criminality. Mm -hmm. I have to protect people. Well, like I say, I admire your job. I wouldn't want to have your job, <laughs> but I admire your job, and I think you're doing an excellent job. Thanks there. very much. Okay. Now, let's move on to something else here. Now, I mentioned to some friends I was speaking with the other day I lived in San Jose for a long time. They mm -hmm. had the police athletic league. Yeah. Okay. That was the opening to getting to deal with the parents. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm thinking if you guys would start something as the sheriff's department, I don't know if the police department has that here or not, but if you guys would start something, I'm sure a lot of business people out there would donate like equipment, you know, for softball games, soccer, whatever. Because if you're not dealing with their child, 
some parent in the home or both parents are going to come out there to see what time it is, okay? And that gives you a chance to interact yeah, with them. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. So let me tell you what we've done. Starting as we are coming out of our recession and our layoffs and, and we are able to take advantage of a, a federal grant, we, we, I put in an idea for this youth services unit. Um, it was a unique. Um, it was a multi. It involved a multi-agency task force on gang intervention, but also youth services. For the first time in our 160-year history, we have dedicated resources to youth services. So five deputies and a sergeant that do nothing but contact youth and do youth services. We got the largest grant award in the country because of that plan, and we set to work immediately. So in early 2002, actually before 2002, but we fully staffed it in two, uh, 12. Mm -hmm. In 2012, we fully staffed it, and we have a youth services unit. It's comprised of a sheriff's athletic league or a SAL. I couldn't mm -hmm. call it a, a PAL, yeah. right, because we're not a police yeah. department, so it's a SAL. Um, but we have everything from you know, boxing to basketball. We have Friday night basketballs. We've partnered very effectively with the faith-based. Faith We've got... Um, the Family Life Center in Del Paso Heights was our first Friday night basketball. Okay. Um, and interestingly enough, the first night, first Friday night, three or four people showed up. We'd go down the street to hand out flyers. People would scatter. But really within a very few short weeks, three or four weeks, um, the place was packed. And but you made that first step. You always have to make that first step. And what we started Look seeing up. was the parents showing up That's and it. showing That's an interest in, right what, what, what's my kid do? What, what's going on with this? And so for a couple of things. Number one, it gives us intro to the parents. And we start everything with a, um, a life lesson, maybe too strong a word, but just a, a little bit of conversation. My officers wear, those officers, the youth officers wear polo shirts. They drive in super cool, wrapped cars. They're, mm. they're nice looking, kid friendly. Um, but they look different than the regular police officers, and they're well-respected. They're recognizable everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we do basketball. We do football. We do rugby, soccer. We, we do um, leadership academies in some of the troubled junior highs. Um, we do um, all sorts of different things. And we touch literally thousands of youth um, every week in this, in this county. So we're not only touching the parents and the families, but we're changing sometimes generational cycles of fearing and hating the police that is taught down from generation to generation. But when you rob, who are you going to call? Well, you can okay. call the police. Well, <laughs> okay. we want you to call the police. That's you that's don't that. always call the police. And so we're hopefully, you know, making a, creating a future recruiting pool for officers mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, give back to their own neighborhoods. But we're also um, showing the folks the, the human side of officers. And so hopefully we can break that cycle of mistrust and, and, uh, you know, and, well, and you hate. saying mistrust, that's a lot of mistrust, but like you say, when there's a crime happening to you, we look to you, okay? Well, we all want to and feel safe. Means, like, with these kids coming out in these organizations that you're doing, they're going to tell other kids. Right. Okay, just like I talked to Anthony Silva, in fact, I'm going to be doing an interview with him in a couple of weeks. You see the gang problems that they have down in Stockton. Oh, okay? yeah. He'll be sitting right there where you are, and like I'm telling him, most of these kids, they don't have a mom and a dad at home, Right. okay? And these gangs become their parents. Right. Okay, give them something to do. Um, my, my wife and I, in, back in Oklahoma, they were talking about the kids hanging out in the parking lots. Right. Had, but nobody was giving them anything to right. do. Right. I had this arena. We had classes. You know, we interacted with these kids, and I was sitting up at home one day, and the phone rang, and it was this lady. She had a, a show called Good Morning Oklahoma back there. She said, James, I've heard what you're doing with the youth down there in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And I'm sure you heard that term, Muskogee, Oklahoma, oh, yeah. before. She said, uh, Would you like to be on my show? Okay, I came up and like I'm telling them, these kids have nothing to do. Yeah, they're gonna find, they're gonna yeah. create something. They're gonna create okay. something to do, and they're gonna fill that void in their life that the parents, and you know, perhaps you know, I I, I was raised with two parents, and so I I got many of the tools that Same I yet. that I now take for granted, yeah. right? And then you, in this line of work, you you quickly realize that young people don't always have those tools. In fact, a lot of the people that we deal with, they didn't have those tools. And so if, you, if they want to belong to something and they can't get it in the, in the home, they're going to go to gangs unless we give them. You want to belong to something? Okay, we'll give you Explorers. We'll give you a leadership academy. We'll give you something to belong to, this Friday night basketball or whatever it is, boxing. Um, so we'll, we'll try and fill those voids in a constructive way, and we'll be there for you week after week. Because if you're missing that, if you're, if you're missing somebody being there for you that you can depend on, we'll give you that too. And so we're... We're trying. I think we're, we're having some very, very good success. Now, you know, when you came that time you were running for office and you were on my radio show, what did I tell you? Whew, I that was, you were seemed like a lifetime ago. African-American opponent. And what did I tell you? Scott, I judge a person by their character, okay? Don't think because I'm sitting here and I'm African-American. I just have to go 
and follow a guy that's African American. If mm-hmm. I think you're the better of the two, I'm going to follow you. Okay. Well, I appreciate and, that. That was, uh, you know, that that was a that was a lifetime ago. But you know, as that's you know the sentiment shared by Dr. King and, and everybody else. And I, I'm the same way. It's 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 someone's character, their ability to follow through with their commitments and everything else. That that's what matters. Now, what makes one a other question I wanted to ask you. Officers in certain communities, say if you're in the Hispanic community, you're in the Ukrainian community, officers that can relate to these, can speak mm-hmm. the language, can relate to, you might call somebody if they're having problems and they don't, they don't understand English. It's a challenge. Okay. It's, it's a challenging situation, like you said. Uh, but can we try to recruit more officers in that will work better in these communities? That's a great question. I mean, currently we do a lot of focus recruiting to get, let me take a step back. Sacramento is, is as you know, one of the most diverse communities in the country. Here. That's right. And so um, that's one of the things I love about Sacramento. I think that's one of its strengths, but that's also a challenge for law enforcement, mm-hmm. right? Which is predominantly a white male profession. Yeah. Um, despite, and that's not because law enforcement agencies aren't trying to recruit that diversity. We, we are. And and, and I think all law enforcement, especially in California, um, it is just extremely difficult to get there. We have um, done everything from going into schools, all sorts of different challenge schools, challenge. Um, we're met with um, cultural issues. So, for example, a lot of the Southeast Asian cultures, first, second generation immigrants, um, they come from a place where they don't and probably shouldn't trust law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Well, that carries with them to this country. And so those are those are some barriers. You have language barriers. But we have had a lot of success. In fact, every major group, whether it's Asian, African American, Hispanic, we're within 5% of representative of our community. So um, African American, for example, in Sacramento County is between 10 and 11%. So we're with it, I think we're about 8%. So we're all under, you know, we're not within 5% over. It's yeah. all under. So we've still got some work to do. Um, but we ha- we do have many officers that speak many languages um, uh, that represent our, our community. So what we've done now is we've we've been so challenged trying to get folks in these from these diverse neighborhoods regionally that we've now reached out. We're trying to be a little bit innovative. Uh, what we did last week, for example, is we've reached out um, to uh, HBCs, historically black colleges, mm-hmm. um, into the mid, Midwest and, and into the East. We went to Prairie View A&M, uh, mm-hmm. just outside of Houston, which mm-hmm. is a historically black college. My we, grandfather helped create one of those, Paul Quinn College. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. There are a lot of them out there, and these are excellent candidates for law enforcement. They're obviously college educated, mm-hmm. just excellent candidates. Well, I think they get though, a lot of backlash from the community. You're a policeman, everybody's, you know, it's got this stereotype. That's true, but that's got to change. That's yeah. got to change. And honestly, I think it'll change a little bit with our youth services. Well, we're doing it with the youth services. So we're hopefully touching a generation that as they get older, it's a long that's a long term strategy, right? Because these folks are elementary school and middle aged school kids. They got a ways to go before they can get there. Mm-hmm. But you know, when they get to be of age where they're gonna be start getting pressure and, and to be recruited into gangs, they're going to see another option. A lot of these kids today, I think, don't see another option. They say, okay, I got this gang. I really don't want to do it, but that's what kids my age do. Mm-hmm. Well, this these kids are going to grow up with another option. They're going to see a different way and and, and hopefully make different decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the... For the um, you know, for the, for the here and now, what we've done a lot with is, is partner with our faith-based, faith-based constituency. Mm-hmm. Um, we've reached out in a real meaningful way to a lot of the faith-based advocacy groups and churches. Mm-hmm. Um, because I can't go into certain neighborhoods and say, hey, you know, you should trust me. I'm the sheriff. Mm-hmm. We only want what's best for you. You should trust me. That's just not going to work. Mm-hmm. But if they hear the same message from their pastors yeah. and from their religious folks and the community leaders for, with whom they trust. Uh, and so I spend a lot of time in the Russian community, in the, in the Asian communities, and um, trying to um, speak with the community leaders so they in turn can have a have a conversation with their constituency and, the, and they'll listen to them. Well, that's what we're saying about this athletic situation. You're catching these kids at a younger age, okay? By the time they get to where they're out of high school, maybe you can get more of those directed into law enforcement. I believe... Okay? I, they can see that you aren't this big, bad organization hey, out here that we are hearing, gobble somebody up. We are hearing for the first time in these in these kids and some of these populations, some of these areas, hey, you know, it'd be cool to be a cop. Or, mm-hmm. you know, they're asking questions about how do I become an officer. Mm-hmm. Never heard that. I mean, and literally, we've, we've, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's emotional because for 160 years of our history, we've never had anything like this. Mm-hmm. And then in this very short time, we've, we've changed attitudes and we've changed attitudes of young people. And, uh, and it's just, it, it's really heartwarming to see them 
having conversations with officer who they never would have trusted or even talked to at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it. The cops show up in young people's lives, it's never to do anything good, yeah. right? We show up and tell them their father's dead, their brother's going to jail, whatever it is. We never show up, it's anything good. Well, now we are showing up and doing good things. Yeah. And the kids are responding, they're incredibly, young people are incredibly resilient. Yeah. Um, and they're responding just in a dramatic fashion. And I know it's gonna pay dividends, probably long after I'm sheriff. Um, but I'm very, very proud of, of you know getting that started and that, that is literally taking on a life of its own. Well, I too, like you were saying, get these ministers, get some of the key people in these different communities to start working. Absolutely. And let these kids see you guys working together, yeah. too, you know? And that will, oh, God, I was so upset here last week. I heard on the uh, TV uh, a 13-year-old was killed on his way to school down in Stockton. And the first thing that pops into a lot of people said, it's gang-related. And nine times out of ten, it was, okay? But give them an alternative. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. You just give them something It's tragic. Else, you know? And it happens with such frequency is that it's often not even reported on the news. I mean, in what world do we live in that a 13-year-old or a young man coming home from school, gang-related or not, I mean, it's still a 13-year-old young man um, with a lifetime of possibilities and potential ahead of him um, getting mowed down. What world do we live in now that that makes you know the, a, a mention on page A10? Um, now, we need to change it. My daughter-in-law mentioned to my son, she said, you should be glad you had a mom and a dad because there's so many kids out there. She said, I went through the foster care system. You know, just a lot of kids don't. And right. they would just, they would kill to have a mom and dad yeah. at home, someone that cared. Okay? Yeah. And I sit and I look at a lot of these athletes, some of them interviewing them on NFL games or NBA, whatever. What do you hear? Hi, mom. You never hardly hear dad, huh? Yeah. And uh, some have dad, but very few. Okay? Right. And it's just like a uh, gentleman said on that show, um, it's Anybody can make a baby, but everybody can't be a daddy, huh? That's right. That's and you right. don't have to make that baby to be a daddy. That, that's going to be a tremendous challenge. And, and, you know, we see what's going on in Ferguson and New York and some of those other areas. That, and it's easy to blame the police. It's easy to blame a corrupt judicial system. Well, we have, we'll use African Americans. We have an overrepresentation of African Americans in our prison. That's absolutely true. Um, we have an overrepresentation of African Americans being arrested versus you know their counterparts versus their percentage in the in those like communities. That's very true. But those are easy questions. Those are the easy, the low hanging fruit. You know, the more much more difficult questions and the politically unpopular questions, frankly, are what causes that? You know, what causes the overrepresentation? Let's talk about the education gap. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the economic disparity between some of our populations. Mm -hmm. What causes that? Well, you know, maybe if you only have a single parent household, maybe that causes an education gap. Maybe that makes, maybe that contributes to someone not doing as well in school. Well, you had a mom and a dad, and I you did. know, having both, and I had both. It's stressful on two par two parents. Yes. Think about one. It's, um, yes. And think about being a female. I, I yeah. I need my I need to tag my wife in some. I have four kids, so right. yeah. I, I need my wife to tag in sometimes because uh, I'd kill one or more of them. I think. <laughs> but yeah, just, I just uh, my uh, daughter-in-law. She said, "You just don't realize how fortunate you are." They you don't. Got a mama and a dad? They do later in life, I think. Yeah. yeah. But, but, when they're parents. But when they're but they don't now. Okay. Yeah. But I'm glad you come to the show today, Scott. Thanks, I mean, it's my really pleasure. Appreciate I appreciate the invitation. Hey, don't don't feel, don't make it so long the next time. Like <laughs> Just okay. send me an invite. We'll make it happen. Okay, appreciate it.